Uh, okay, um, final talk. I'm going to talk about uh, our packet generator Moongen. And, well, if you think of packet generators, typically most people think of like a big box like this one. Um, but, of course, that's the boring way to do it. Uh, we all love these network cards way more than big, clunky, expensive boxes. And, well, what we built, we, meaning mostly me at the Technical University of Munich, it's um, the project for my PhD thesis, basically. And we built a packet generator on top of DPDK and uh, LuaJIT, which I'll go into detail later. Um, there are basically four main points to MoonJet. And four really important points, I can't go into all of them today. Um, but the main points are the first one, obviously, it has to be fast. And of course, being fast is easy with using DPDK. Um, and all our API, we at all places do explicit multi-core support and, and the usual stuff. Um, so the second thing, we want to be flexible. This goes back to how uh, I started the project um, because I've been using a lot of packet generators in the past and, well, a lot of software packet generators. And I've always found they often have great configuration. They have like uh, a lot of command line options or even a little um, embedded language to specify what kind of packet you want to send. And lastly, there has been more movement towards even scripting the packet generator itself. Um, but I've always found I at some point wanted to use some feature that wasn't supported and then I had to touch the code uh, to get whatever new tunnel protocol working. Um, yeah, so what we did with Moonjam was uh, we moved all the packet generation logic into a user controlled script. That means if you're using Moongen, you are not writing a configuration file. There is no configuration, basically. Um, instead, you will have to program something. It's really the target audience uh, for Moongen are programmers and not people who just want to configure something. Um, so what you do is you write the whole main loop. You write everything um, in the package generator, there's just a really, really helpful API such that you can set up your standard tests in uh, less than 20 lines of code or so. Um, and I'll show an example of how to do this for a simple VXLAR tunneling test uh, later. So then there are two um, important <coughs> points. Um, that go to precision and accuracy. Typically, when you think of a software packet generator and you hear, yeah, I want to do latency measurement, then you will think, oh, latency in software. We heard yesterday with the T-Rex talk um, that you can do one microsecond. That about matches my experience with doing latency measurement in software, uh, which is why in MoonGen we do hardware support with a few clever tricks. Um, come to that later. And the Fourth point is rate control, meaning sending packets in a specific, at a specific time. It often the basic setting of the packet generator is like I want to generate one gigabit of traffic, I want to generate three gigabit of traffic. Sometimes there's an option to set the traffic pattern, like I want to use a POSOR process uh, to generate the packet, I want constant bitrate, I want bursty traffic, or whatever. But it turns out they are often not implemented well and they often don't work properly. Um, we have an upcoming paper about that where we uh, use the NetFPGA to evaluate different packet generators and how they actually generate packets. And it turns out when doing something like latency measurement, just the, the spacing between packets uh, can have a huge impact of the latency of a device under test. So it's really important to um, pay attention to this one. But I've cut the, this part for my talk due to time reasons. So what I will be going in today is time stamping and the flexibility by just showing you a quick example of how you could do a VXLAN test with MoonGen. Um, so first for the time stamping, it's, well, here's basically an example of what you can get. These are two histograms of latency of two devices under test. The top one is an open research packet forwarder, and the bottom one is 
a more complex setup involving um, a virtual machine and OpenVS which running inside the virtual machine and the usual complex stuff that leads to a more complicated long tail distribution. And what you can see here is at the top graph, um, you can really see the effect of uh, interrupt rate swapping because this was just regular open research, no DPTK, open research, uh, nothing fancy, just um, stock kernel, stock open research. And you can see there's some red swapping going on and you get this nice uh, uniform distribution, or well, not so nice depending on what you do. And this is kind of the demo of how precise and accurate time stepping can be, even though it's a software packet generator. So, how we achieve this uh, high precision is that we misuse the PTP time synchronization feature on Intel Nex. Basically, we send out UDP packets that kind of look like uh, PTP packets, not exactly, and then we tell the NIC, yeah, this is a PTP packet, please take a timestamp for us, and the NIC will happily do it. Um, Turns out there are some weird restrictions, uh, like you have to do UDP packets, um, but on most NICs you can use an arbitrary UDP port, um, unless the new Fortville NICs, they are like, uh, it only likes port 390, that's kind of sad that the older NICs are better there. Um, but often for measuring latency, it's enough to do, um, to have some IP packet and it doesn't really matter for most test cases. So, Yeah. Yeah. Um, the top one is okay. So this question was what the difference between the two is. The top one is just stock open research between two physical ports. The bottom one is open research into a virtual machine, another open research in the virtual machine, out of the virtual machine to the open research out of the physical port. So then you get like complicated long tail distributions and stuff, and it gets only more complicated from there. And just to demonstrate how precise uh, it really is. Here is the latency distribution of an experiment uh, running on hardware. This is a, uh, the latency distribution of a PICA-8 um, open flow switch. Um, nice 10 gigabit hardware switch. And what we did here, we sent multiple flows uh, to the switch and uh, mixed them on the switch using open flow rules and um, set a quality of service setting and so on. And then uh, send them out on one port such that they, that there are well multiple flows going out at the same port, but one is supposed to be prioritized, and this is the latency of the prioritized flow. And what you can see is you get a bimodal distribution. Um, this is kind of not what you would expect because if you read the data sheet of the switch, you will read here yeah, it has a latency of 800 nanoseconds, and then you see. Well, it has a best case latency of 800 nanoseconds for like 30% of the packets, but 70% of the packets are actually at 3.5 microseconds. So what happened there? And this is just to, to showcase what kind of problems you can debug with this precise uh, time stamping. And in this case, the problem is, of course, that even if you prioritized your flow, um, but there is the case that the output port is currently being used by the background flow, and if it's currently transmitting a packet, and then there's a new packet from the prioritized flow, well, it can't just stop transmitting the packet, such that there are two paths through the switch, one the cut-through path and one with a short buffer in between. And yeah, when you then increase the rate of the background traffic, uh, eventually, you will see that even the prioritized flows get uh, up to a latency of 3.5 microseconds because the port is just always used uh, by the background traffic every time one of the prioritized packets comes in. Uh, such a thing would, for example, not be possible with any uh, software time stepping approach um, and was usually the reason why a lot of people bought hardware package generators to get these kind of insights into hardware. But now it's possible with just um, misusing the PTP feature in a clever way. Um, yeah, so this was my first point about precise and accurate time stamping. The uh, second point is about how to, how to write a script for Moonjam. As I've said, we, you really have to program something. It's, we don't have yet a user interface, but we are currently working on, we are working on a REST API and a simple web front end um, to 
get at least some semblance of a user interface, but the usual way it's intended to be used is you write a script and we use the scripting language Lua for it, basically because the language is extremely fast and easy to embed, and especially the part of Lua that's important um, to be embedded is that it makes it really easy to say I have some memory here and it's supposed to represent a packet that looks like this, uh, please do it and please generate me an accessor for a 32-bit field in a fast way. That's really easy to do. It was one of the main reasons to choose Lua. I uh, actually had a longer discussion with the T-Rex guy yesterday evening and he's also looking into Lua for his packet modifications now. Um, yeah. So here for the example, I told you we want to generate, say, a uh, VXLAN packet stack and the first thing you do, you declare your packet stack and then and, uh, you can just stack arbitrary packets and of course there's just a default at the beginning and then there's something more complicated in there where we just have to rename this. The syntax with the two curly brackets uh, is just, okay, we have a second IPv4 header, let's call this one inner IP. Um, just such that the names don't collide. And this stack you generate here, this is um, JIT compiled in real time and it generates a C struct and it generates um, all the getters and setters that handle all the annoying stuff. For example, if you have a complex stack like this and you want to fill it from code, you usually would have to think about uh, uh, what to have to write into the length field of the outer UDP header. If I have a VLAN tag in the inner thing and if I don't have, it handles all that annoying stuff for you. You just tell it I want a packet with a, a total length of 120 bytes and then it will give you all the length fields Prefilled, there are helper functions to calculate the checksums, to offload the checksums, and so on. Uh, just everything you would expect from a reasonably usable stack. Uh, yeah, and then you write your main function, which is basically just DPDK code behind a Lua wrapper. And it then typically looks like this you generate a mempool. The usual thing in this case, we gave it a nice uh, callback function here just to um, provide some default values. We want to generate VXLAN packets, and in this case, we can say, okay, create a new mempool and pre initialize all packets in that mempool with this struct. And we use the useful fill method, which is automatically generated um, by the script for the stack, and we get um, nice parameters in the constructor for every possible field you want to fill. Fill and this is just called once for every packet. That's basically our template, and the stack already handles stuff like setting well-known values like the UDP ports for the XLAN that you can override if you want to test something fancy. Um, yeah, then the main part you write the actual main loop in Lua code. Um, now you might think, oh, this sounds slow. You are using a scripting language to write the main loop. It's actually pretty fast. Um, the typical performance you can get is around 25 million packets per second on a single CPU core. Um, if you have a main loop that does something like randomize two fields and uh, do the partial checksum calculation for UDP checksum offloading on a link that doesn't do the pseudo header checksum, and yeah, you know, the hardware restrictions. Um, so what you basically do, you write your main loop, you um, allocate some buffers, and then you loop over the buffers and do randomize whatever fields you want to randomize on a per packet basis. And then you tell the buffs to set the relevant offloading uh, check, uh, the offloading bits in the flex. And then you just have a queue from somewhere and then you can send it out. And actually, if you go through the presentation, I have included a link in there if you download the PDF from the website uh, to the full example that I've uh, written last week that well generates packets like this. And uh, the, the big thing here is that you can really put any code in there. If you want to do something complex with stateful code, whatever, if you uh, want to uh, modify something in a non-trivial manner, if you want to add sequence numbers, just write the code, put it in there, and it will magically run fast. And the other thing is that I don't have in the presentation here is that it's basically a full wrapper around DPDK. So you can not only send packets, you can also receive packets. For example, um, I've used this to check for reordering and so on by just adding another um, task, as you call it, which basically maps to an RTE thread. 
and you can do something like receive all the packets, check that you got all sequence numbers, check that the sequence numbers are in order and so on, or even implement something like a simple protocol. Uh, for example, if you look at our GitHub repository, then you can see other people what they've been doing this, and there are some people, for example, doing uh, research on new protocols, and they have a prototype implementation just in a few lines of your code, and it can be a really quick way to prototype something, and you get the package generator basically for free. So, Mundan is available on GitHub. Um, it comes with a lot of examples, and proper, one of the examples will hopefully or probably kind of match your use case, and then you can start by modifying one of the examples. Yeah, any questions? There are some questions back there. Yeah. So, um, you talked about it being uh, multi-core ready, so does the transmission interception use multiple cores and multiple hardware queues? Um, um, I don't have the, there's some boilerplate code around this that I don't have on the slides. Basically, there's a main function where you can do stuff like define command line arguments and whatever, and there's also, also the, no, I don't have the boilerplate code anywhere. Um, there is a part where you start tasks, which basically map to this, and typically you write a task like this, and then you could start it two times with different parameters uh, to generate from two cores by passing two different... And it's receiving the same thing? You need to receiving. write a receive loop, or is it just um, default? Yeah, receiving is the same thing. Um, you have to write a receive loop. The only thing that we, and you of course have to configure RSS, but it's really easy to just tell um, it's like I want four RSS queues, and then you get four queues and can use them. And uh, the only thing where you don't have to write a receive loop is the timestamping thing, because it comes with, a, uh, with some with some utility functions that do all the annoying thing of uh, checking sequence numbers on the timestamps and receiving the packets and doing a, we use flow director on the flex byte filters to uh, filter timestamp packets and that's already in the framework. Just, just a quick one, we, we put in some new PTP um, uh, APIs in, in the last couple of releases. Did you use those or were you uh, using them as a I actually uh, just a few weeks ago ported this to the new DPDK APIs. It was very helpful because when I started, I had to implement all the driver stuff myself, and it was horrible because every week does it slightly differently. And yeah, thank you for supporting that DPDK. Okay. Paul, thank you very much.